welcome everyone. Thanks for coming out on a nice cold um, re return to winter kind of day. So hopefully flower power will, you know, be something that can warm your hearts. Um, we um, thought that this was good timing for an exhibition of this type, just because um, of all the color um, that's involved, especially with um, some of our Ohio cold and gray early spring days. So um, just a, a couple words about the exhibit um, before I get into the presentation here. And um, so I've done something a little bit different with this presentation. Our exhibit, the way that we've set it up, we organized it kind of by color. So when you go down and see the galleries, it's really going to be quite a colorful impact as you go into the blue and purple room, followed by the pink and red room, followed by the sort of black, browns, whites, neutrals kind of room, and then into another room that has a lot of hot colors and it's a little eye popping. So, um, so we didn't really arrange things chronologically. And mostly having worked in a museum of historic clothing, I've kind of been on a chronological um, focus for most of our exhibits. And that's kind of what I'm gonna do a little bit here. I thought, um, I could start out with some of our earliest pieces and it's gonna be kind of looking at what was sort of trending design wise and then also with some different techniques. So with that, um, see if I can, other one, there we go. I was hitting the reverse button, <laughs> learning my technology. Um, so these are two of some of the earliest dresses that we have in this particular exhibit. And what we did is really sort of focused on the 20th century. So um, these are both from the earlier 1920s. Their hemlines are down um, somewhere between the knee and the ankle. So the real flapper era of the 1920s really didn't hit till mid 20s, till about 25. And it didn't really last all that long. So these are predating um, some of the, the flapper area era. And you can see next to the um, lady on the in the black there, we've got a little case next to this that has some 20s um, accessories as well. And there's a great little 20s shoe that's in there. And that shoe is actually worn by Mrs. Peters, who lived in the house that is the Decorative Arts Center of Ohio. So there are a couple of items um, that we have in the exhibit that were worn by Mrs. Peters um, in the Reese Peters house. So it's kind of nice to kind of bring them back home um, to where they were. And so um, the two of these dresses, it's really very dense beading on the black dress and not as much on, on the, the brown. And this, both of these dresses, this is the first time they've kind of been out on exhibit. They've been in storage, you know, for all the while that I've been at Ohio State and probably beyond that. There just hasn't been an opportunity to bring them out, but I'm hoping since we are in the 2020s, maybe I can do a, you know, throwback 20s exhibit once uh, we get our new gallery open at Ohio State. <laughs> um, and one of the things that was interesting, you know, just kind of looking at the color combinations, this brown, you know, with the pink beading was just such an odd color. And um, ironically, we found some other things that pick up that brown in that gallery and in that space. So it doesn't quite look as odd as it does um, just by itself. And so this was a great opportunity to be able to bring her out because both of them, their beading is remarkably intact. And there's some close-ups of just the beading on the black dress and just the, the smallness of the size of the beads um, is, is pretty remarkable. And then just the uh, the patterns on the, the pink with the little sort of rhinestone floral centers. And then we also have some other beaded 20s <clears throat> items in the exhibit, a couple of, of little handbags. Um, this is one, <coughs> excuse me, and this is another that has um, great floral pattern and a little butterfly kind of right in the middle um, of, the, uh, of the pattern itself. And so we did a little bit of a blow up over here again to kind of look at the size of the beads. 
And then another 20s dress progressing a little on um, into the decade. This one's a little bit shorter. Um, this black silk dress um, has this amazing chain stitch embroidery um, covering the dress. So I'm just kind of showing a, um, you know, just the overall dress with the great scalloped hemline and then a detail of the chain stitch embroidery itself. In addition to the dress, we have this fabulous little pair of black suede gloves that have chain stitch embroidery on them as well. And I love these gloves just because each little fingertip and the tip of the thumb has an added little floral motif added onto it. So they were um, something that just had to go in the exhibit. And then this beautiful um, black satin purse with a chain stitch embroidery um, and the, the jeweled clasp on it is something that is kind of going from the 20s into the 30s. But those you can see some of those same motifs are all you know part of a, a similar time period in this particular case. And then of course, so we do have a number of accessories in this exhibit along with the dresses. So we are really proud of how many accessories we've been able to add into this show. And these are just a couple of examples that we have. The straw hat is an earlier, 1922 style of hat that has that wider brim on it. And you really get that traditional 20s cloche more mid and later and as you're heading into the 30s. So this great little velvet cloche with its um, little hollyhock kind of flowers that are um, going vertical is just a really um, great example. Both of these are in our pink room. <laughs> so you'll be able to see them there. And then um, this is more of the display case that was next to our black beaded dress, but we had a couple of um, black satin uh, 20s hats in there, earlier 20s hats, but they have fabric roses um, and other fabric trim that have embellished these two hats. And this is another view of that, that chain stitch embroidered purse up front. And then um, both of these dresses are probably, they're about 1929 to 31. So it's as that hemline is dropping down again in the 30s. They're both a silk chiffon kind of fabric. And certainly the, the black and orange dress um, was um, a dress worn by Anita Eisenstein. Um, so I think she was with Gallery Players, um, might be a name that's familiar to some of you. Um, it's also, it has a Montaldo's label in it. And so Montaldo's in Columbus opened up in 1931. So that dress, you know, is maybe one of the first dresses that was bought at Montaldo's here in Columbus. So that's kind of a great um, little piece. And it's got that great sort of handkerchief hemline that was so popular. And I have just been completely enamored of blue flowers in this exhibit because we have a couple of instances of that and just having these fabulous blue daisies with their orange centers and um, just the scale of them and, and how dense they are um, was a dress that um, I'm, you know, just really wanted to get in the exhibit as well. No label in this one, unfortunately. And then um, we have this great dress in our blue and purple room and you can see, you know, in the background, um, some of the other examples that are in this space. Uh, but this is a Hattie Carnegie velvet dress that uh, has these wonderful floral appliques down around the hem, little, more little velvet appliques, and then this sort of corsage, um, deal, whoops, um, this corsage kind of thing up on her right shoulder. And I did want to have a view where you could see um, that sort of typical low back of the 1930s. This was something new that was happening in evening dresses. And it kind of goes along with a, an increase in sports and leisure activity in the 1930s. People were having more time to um, participate in um, active things um, and more people were involved and in, more women were involved in swimming. And so because it was also healthy to get a tan um, at the time, what they did is they were designing this, the evening gowns to copy sort of the low back swimsuits so you wouldn't have um, problems with tan lines as you were wearing your evening gowns. So you can see that there, but that was yeah, kind of a fun little 30s tidbit. 
So a couple of other, these are two um, later 30s gowns. And what I always think of in the 30s as the fashion for florals were all of these small figure prints. So a lot of density, a lot of um, small florals just kind of scattered throughout. And both of these are two um, lightweight, the, this one over here is actually a very lightweight cotton. Um, this one is a silk crepe chiffon. Um, the, the cotton actually has a label in it. It's a dress made by Nellie Don. Nellie Don was a Kansas City designer who was really known for doing a lot of practical women's um, clothing. And um, she's kind of researched a, a bit by my colleagues that are um, further out west of us here. Um, but she's a, a, a well a well known name among costume historians, not so much you know about the people who are doing the celebrity fashion designers. And these two dresses are um, actually an Yves Saint Laurent, um, the orange here with the overall print, and a Narelle Tassel. Um, the Narelle Tassel was worn by um, Mrs. Galbraith, Dorothy Galbraith, um, and so. The 1970s was kind of a revival of 1930s fashion. And I think the both of these sort of overall small figure print florals are, are part of that um, revival as well. I mean, most things were may have gone into more biased dresses as far as a silhouette, which neither of these are. These are very typical 70s sort of silhouettes, but the prints are a little more typical of the kind of um, 30s floral prints that were going on. The, the Yves Saint Laurent is your you know, typical um, 70s shirt dress. This is one of our few pieces in the exhibit that's actually made out of wool. It's a very lightweight wool, um, like a wool chalet kind of material. It's um, and um, it's a Yves Saint Laurent, it's his Rive Gauche line, which was, Rive Gauche was, he was the first one of the French designers to really break away from strict couture runway fashion, going into the designer ready to wear because the whole fashion industry was changing in the early 70s. And the couture designers really needed to tap into that mass market um, that you know more people could afford those clothes. Um, so that was um, something that he was doing. The Norel to sell, um, you might be familiar with um, Norman Norell as a designer in women's fashion. And um, this dress, Norman Norell passed away suddenly in 1972. And so Gustave Tassel took over his line to help kind of finish out that last season or two. Um, Tassel had his own line of clothing, but um, so that's why it's sort of the, the hyphenated label on this particular dress. And then um, kind of jump into the 1940s. We don't have a lot of clothing in the exhibit from the 1940s. Um, this everyday dress is one of the um, dresses in particular. And this was one of the dresses I had a real difficult time with in trying to figure out, well, which color room do I put you in? Because <laughs> she's got them all. And, um, and it's just such a, a great, you know, it's just a, a lovely little thing. So this, when we got into our um, sort of our, our last room where we had a overall sort of garden concentrations of flowers and, and colors as well. Um, but, the, but this worked out really well because um, next to her in this display case, we have this great little, these two little sort of red, white, and blue hats, um, straw hats from the 1940s, and this great little platform shoe um, that um, was also from the late 40s. So it seemed like must have been some kind of color trend that was going on for um, overall color combinations. Um, one of the, the, this other little hat is one of my favorites. Um, it just looks like someone put a you know, would put a bunch of grass on your head and you've got some little crocuses or flowers of some kind coming out of there. But man, the whimsical hats of the 1950s and 60s are just something that um, does, you know, you can understand why people bought so many hats and saved them and held on to them because they were just such great little treasures. Um, and then the other little um, person matching shoe um, in front is more from the 1950s. So these are a couple of other hats that we had from the 1940s that were just really had to put them in here because their shapes were so fantastic. Um, this 
navy blue um, with the purple it has a Paris label in it. And the other brown straw does really not have a label, but you know, it's just such a wonderful shape. She had to be included. And then um, just kind of jumping up to our 1950s, this great sort of crinoline skirted silhouette. Um, and pretty much, uh, I think three out of the four here have some kind of crinoline petticoat underneath their skirt to make sure that we're getting the right silhouette connected to them. And of course, blue roses again. So the blue flowers, I love it's a, just a little cocktail sort of garden dress has um, sequins up in the bodice um, that give it a little flash up there. Um, the uh, red rose chiffon um, and with the organza collar has no label in it whatsoever. Um, the one um, that's the, the dress with the matching coat, we have, I think, three ensembles that had matching coats with them. And this was one that no longer has a label in it. The donor from New York who gave it to us wore a lot of um, patu. She had a lot of patu suits. And I don't know if this is something that um, would have also had a patu label. There was the another um, curator thought maybe it was an Arnold Scazi because he did a lot of matching prints um, with, with some of his coats, but a lot of time that was the print was the, the print matched the lining of the coat inside, but it's a great, you know, sort of three quarter length silk coat. Um, same fabric on the bodice of the dress, but the skirt of the dress is actually a couple layers of chiffon, but the same print. And then our um, lady on the end with the small um, purple, or purple, red, blue, and light blue tiny poppies is a Pauline Trujier. And her, um, her bodice up here is all kind of tucks that are gathered in to fit um, in the top of the, the bodice. Um, and then released into the fullness of the skirt. So a couple of other jumping into the evening gowns and more blue roses um, are um, these dresses are from um, Emilio Estevez, who was um, a contemporary of James Galanos and Arnold Scazi in the mid 1950s. Irene, who was Irene Lance Gibbons, um, designed for. MGM starting in 1940. Um, she was originally with Bullock's Wilshire in California as their in-house designer, custom designer. And then once Adrian decided he wasn't going to design for MGM anymore, um, Irene stepped in and then she left and went back to Bullock's Wilshire. Um, and so her clothes um, are dating more 1947 to about 1962 when she passed away. And then on the other very end here is um, a dress that was designed by Samuel Friedman. And so I've done some close-ups. All of these dresses have the same or very similar technique in, in the pattern um, of creating the floral designs. You can see that the edges are, especially in the, in the blue, look very blurry around um, the edges of these designs, kind of almost a watercolor kind of effect. Um, but when you actually get close and look at what the textile is, um, it's something called a, a warp print or chine as it's known in the French. And um, both of these, I've got the two images because the, the blue is actually, it's printed to look like it's a warp print, but it's not really a warp print. So a warp print, you know, when you're making a, a, a textile, you've got warp going in the lengthwise direction, and then you've got your weft yarns that go over, under, over, under, over, under. And the warp print is basically that the warp is printed with all of the different colors, but before it's woven. So when you get to the weaving, the threads kind of get a little out of line, and that's what creates the blurry effect. But if you look at this closely, these, um, colors are more than a uh, yarn's width wide. So, but if you're kind of looking over here, you can see, you know, if you're up close and personal that these are much spikier kind of blurry lines in that one. So this is a true warp print. This one's the cheaper version, 
made to look like the more expensive war print, but it obviously, you know, was a motif um, that was um, very popular in the 50s and 60s when these dresses were made. I also love the fact that the, the Samuel Friedman, the print over here, you have this woven in floral pattern. And on top of that, you've got the warp printing as well. So it's a very complex textile when you get down to the bottom of it. And this was another, this is the 1990s um, warp print fabric. This is an Yves Saint Laurent Couture dress that belonged to Terry Blair Hamlish. And um, Terry Blair, born here in Ohio, worked in um, Columbus for the local television stations, um, eventually moved to New York, met Marvin Hamlish. And um, from the notes in, in our files, um, it was, or I'm not even sure if it was something that I Googled, but it, uh, the way they met is that their housekeepers introduced them to one another. <laughs> so you kind of wonder, it's like, you know, how, you know, these, you know, people sort of meet one another. Well, it was, you know, the housekeepers had a little meddling going on in there. So, um, and so I, I don't know if they both still had a job, you know, after they got together, but, um, but this is another um, true silk warp print um, textile. And so I've kind of got a, a close up of the, the garment it, of the textile itself, but also a close up of the sleeve um, over here and all of these little white stitches. So as a true couture dress, something that's couture means that it's made to your specific measurements, right? So it's not something you're buying off the rack, it's fit to your body specifically. So in addition to that and the really high end materials that go into it, it's also the amount of handwork and hand finishing that goes into the garment itself. So there are zippers on the sleeves at the wrists of this dress, as well as a zipper closure up the back. And all of those little white stitches, those are the back stitches that are hand stitching those zippers um, in the wrists um, onto that fabric. So, so that's what goes into the thousands of dollars that you know cost of, of couture dresses. So. But she's one of those that's kind of right at the top of the stairs as you come into the gallery. So she was one of our our you know, main pieces that we just wanted to show off up there. So these are a couple of other gowns from the 1950s into 60s, late 50s um, into the 60s. Um, the sort of light green with the big bright red um, roses is by Philip Hulitar, who's an American designer. And um, the pink um, is a, a dress um, by Milgram, um, who is a, I believe is a store. Um, in um, New York. And so, although I think there was a Milgram that was here in Columbus for a while, um, I think Mrs. Eugene Gray, who became Adelaide's and, or might've been Milgram in between Mrs. Eugene Gray and Adelaide's. Um, but uh, anyway, it was a local um, Ohio, Columbus, Ohio woman who, who donated that to us. Both of these dresses have um, a, a flocked kind of, uh, appearance to their textile. So you can see that um, the red and some of the other parts of the dress have this fuzzy um, kind of aspect to them. And um, so velvet has that technique as well, where you've got that, you know, basically that, that pile fabric that's coming in there. And flocking, <clears throat> you know, I think we started in the 1960s getting flocked Christmas trees, right? Where you could just, uh, but that was usually some kind of um, synthetic fiber that could be attached um, with an adhesive onto the fabric. And, and these are most likely, um, these are more of a, the, a velvet technique. So that velvet technique um, in creating these, um, so with velvet, you've got your regular warps and wefts, and then velvet is a supplementary warp. So you, in weaving velvet, you there's a rod that gets inserted as you're um, in the, the warp direction, and that extra warp gets cut along the top of the rod. There's a, a slit that you can take a razor through so that you end up having all the little ends kind of standing up to get your nap. Um, in this kind of fabric, you obviously don't have the velvet all the way through the whole thing. So um, the velvet is voided 
you know, there are places where it's just not used in certain parts where you've got the, the flat satin background. So you got a great um, sort of three-dimensional um, technique and, and feel to this, this textile. And that was um, one of the things as we were going through trying to decide what to put in this exhibit, you know, what are, we really wanted a lot of different kinds of textures. We wanted, you know, all the different colors, um, different scales of patterns, all of that kind of thing. So, um, so we had a, a fairly lengthy editing process to um, try and find um, what we've all got in the exhibit. And um, another one of these great textures that we have is lace. And so this is a dress that belonged to Lady Bird Johnson. So this is a, um, it's a Molly Parnas dress. And um, it is these overall floral motifs. And Judy and I go back and forth on, is this lace? Is this applique? What is, I mean, it's definitely these larger motifs that are connected together, um, you know, at the various points of the flower. So it's either a, a very oversized lace, um, but it does have, parts where, up, especially up around the, the neckline of the dress, um, there are more of those motifs that are applied on top of the fabric to um, give that, you know, sort of finished look to the, to the neck. Um, but one of the great things about this dress, even though it too was something that uh, Molly Parnas is not necessarily a couture fashion name, um, although certainly in the 60s, and 50s and into the early 70s, the stores like Bergdorf Goodman's and um, even here in Mont in Columbus, I think Montaldo's had an in-house designer for a while that they would be able to do some customization um, to the designs. And so I think that's probably something that happened here with, with Lady Bird's dress because uh, it's really difficult to find where there's a seam anywhere in this dress. I mean, you can definitely see the seam of the zipper in the lining, but you can't find a side seam where someone has kind of cut through the lace motifs and put right sides together and stitched it up and done sort of the traditional stuff. So they, what they did is they actually cut around the motifs of the flowers like they did for this closure in the back. So there's little snaps here, snaps there, snaps there, so that those would overlap and that you would have um, you wouldn't break up the line of the design of the pattern of the textile. So that is, again, you know, a couture kind of technique that really, you know, there's some thought and consideration going into respect the, the materials and the, and the garment that the um, dress is made of. So this was worn by Lady Bird on her 59th um, birthday um, in, uh, in a club in um, San Antonio, you know, party that Lyndon through for her. So we have a great picture of the two of them together at the party dancing. Um, so, and then a couple of other lace examples that we have in the collection, the tan colored Helene <clears throat> Barbieri, which has this Guy Pure um, lace um, with all of these the cords in it that makes it just a really fabulous, you know, more textured than just a flat lace. And um, the pastel blue and green and white was a, a dress that belonged to um, Elizabeth Park Firestone, Mrs. Harvey Firestone II. And um, it's this re-embroidered lace, which the ground is lace, but all of these um, motifs on top are a soutache braid. They're really thin quarter inch wide, um, cloth braid in various colors that's been applied and stitched on um, to create the motifs. And you can see the sort of net ground behind there and some other motifs of the lace, like some of the white peeking out, but then you've got this other layer that's kind of built up on top. And um, around the back, I don't have a back view, but there's sort of a pale green and a pale blue chiffon drape that kind of goes around the back of that. And um, Mrs. Firestone did a lot of shopping um, in the 40s, well, 20s through the 60s, early 60s, really. She, she shopped a lot in Paris and um, would go to Patu, houses of Patu and Balenciaga and Dior. And, um, and it was really interesting when we were doing some research on her um, that she ended up going to the house of Dior because the woman who was her head fitter or dressmaker seamstress that she worked with um, at Dior had moved from Dior, had moved from the house of Patu over to Dior 
Um, and so she just kind of followed her trusted dressmaker that she knew could make everything look good on her. And um, she did in her Newport home have a, a three-story closet. So um, she had quite a few garments. Um, most of her clothing now um, is at the Henry Ford Museum up in Dearborn, Michigan. And um, we did a Dior in Ohio exhibit a couple of years ago where we borrowed some ball gowns, Dior ball gowns from her. We had a couple of Dior suits in our collection from Mrs. Firestone, but they had most of the real fancy stuff up there. And um, so this leads us to a couple of other fun um, applique dresses. So these are two of my favorites in the exhibit. Um, this um, Stavropoulos, whoops, I keep pushing the wrong button. Um, this Stavropoulos uh, has, George Stavropoulos has all these wonderful, um, again, blue flowers and um, these tendrils kind of applied onto this um, organza base. So it's a very textural three-dimensional kind of um, garment and textile. And then the, um, the 1950s, um, daisies that are applied, uh, the 1950s gown with the, the daisies applied onto the organza skirt um, of this dress. Um, so they were, um, you know, they were definitely ones that um, were not going to be edited out. So, but, um, oh, and then, um, so like jumping into um, some more 1960s and really getting to very large scale motifs and the designs of the textiles. So opposite our Terry Hamlish purple at the top of the stairs is this um, another George Stavropoulos design um, with this ginormous um, floral hand you know, painted design on the skirt of this dress. And it also has these wonderful sort of hanging chiffon, very wispy sleeves. Um, that we wanted to make sure we had a mannequin that kind of pulled those out so you could really see um, those entirely and also have the legs of the mannequin spread enough that we could see that floral motif um, of that um, skirt of that dress right in front. In the middle, we have a great little um, 1960s mini um, Hannah More uh, design. And Hannah More is the Japanese designer um, known maybe more for doing a lot of scarves um, as well, but this um, little silk chiffon dress uh, was was just, you know, the the motif of this great big pink um, rose on the front of this dress um, just was too much fun to leave behind. And then um, in the the far corner we have um, this uh, our other lightweight wool garment worn by um, Mrs. Cyrus Fulton from Lancaster. Uh, it is a, um, it's actually a hostess pajama set. So those are pants that she's wearing. Um, hard to tell. We got the, you know, mannequin with the widest spread legs, but still the, the pant legs are so wide um, that you can't really tell that those are pants. But I mean, I just love the, you know, the closure down front. She's got buttons that kind of go down the front of the top of this dress and into the pants, but you can't really tell that there's a closure there because they really did a great job of matching up the floral motifs on either side. And just these sort of giant kind of carnations. Now, Mrs. Cyrus Fulton, Harriet was um, very fond of pink. Um, and we've often joking in the collection when we come across something that's very bright pink, it's like, oh, is that a Mrs. Cyrus Fulton? Sure enough. So, um, but yeah, it was great to be able to bring, you know, some of the local, um, local things back to Lancaster in this particular exhibit. In fact, I think um, this dress back here with the poppies is another Mrs. Cyrus Fulton. Um, so again, a little more pink in that one too. Um, and then, yeah, a couple of other sort of large motif florals. Um, this one, this brown one kind of reminded me of my 1920s blue daisies. Um, but, uh, you know, just a sort of a different colorway, but I love this Bill Blass, um, this is a velvet dress, this great maxi dress that has the big sort of lily motif, and then also, um, you know, these anemones or some kind of um, just great floral designs in there, so just that large scale um, motifs as well, ah, and these, as we're getting into our sort of, obviously, the one of the in the bright colored, you know, hot 
intense color room. Um, again, these large scale floral motifs, but very much a Donald Brooks um, mat lisse dress. You can see the, the texture in the weave of the dress itself and just these intense bright colors um, that are kind of getting into the psychedelia of the, um, the late 1960s. Um, this Ulrich Royce in the middle, I love, because um, you can see uh, these patterns where you're really starting to ab ab abstract the floral design where it's not very realistic, um, flattening out and very much so in the way of a lot of um, Japanese textile design. So the flattening of the cherry blossoms or the plum blossoms here. And um, in addition to that, there's also a little dragon up here at the um, top of the of the dress and the, the OB style belt kind of, you know, picking up on a lot of that Japanese design, taking the textile as a as a inspiration to um, add a few design elements to the dress. And then we have this great lime green um, dress. Again, this is a velvet and another velvet, which I, I find real interesting, um, but very, again, flattened out sort of lily pad kind of motifs in the um, dress itself with a little chiffon jacket over the top. The designer of this is Bessie, B-S-S-I. Um, and I think that's kind of following along the lines of Emilio Pucci, some of the designs that he did in the 1960s that were much more abstract um, florals. Ah, and then I wanted to make sure I had a couple of examples of our buttons that we've got there. So, um, so these were um, uh, a card of lucite buttons um, that we had that are all in this clear plastic, um, different examples. And um, this was one of the one of the cards that I saw that I thought, oh my gosh, this is just great. We have to um, have this included in our, our botany and buttons exhibit. So we have the lucite buttons. Um, so these are, you know, mid 20th century um, when when the plastics were um, available to do that. Um, and then these are all 18th century buttons. So this card was mostly put together by uh, Anne Rudolph, um, Mrs. Rudolph, um, who is this collection um, is all, this was all her collection of buttons that came to us at Ohio State in about 1991. She was a um, librarian and um, had gotten her education in botany. So she was really enamored of florals um, and botanicals. And so she, um, was also the uh, an archivist for the National Button Society and the Buckeye State Button Society. And um, we really just like to kind of, you know, when we talk initially about buttons, people are like, an exhibit of buttons, like, what's that? But when you look at these, these examples of these buttons, and we've supplied magnifying glasses um, down um, in the gallery as well, so that you can get up and look close and personal at these. These are truly works of art um, on a miniature scale. So all of the different materials of the ceramics or the lucite or the, the metals, the paste jewels, um, the type of painting that goes into some of these um, definitely is worth your time. And um, one other um, example that I had was all of our ceramics um, with um, various kinds of floral motifs, mostly roses, on some of these, but we have some of some of these realistic um, pansies and roses, um, and these are actually Staffordshire. Um, and I think we also have, um, in some cases, um, some Royal Copenhagen. So the same sort of ceramics um, porcelain manufacturers that were doing fine dinnerware were also working at producing some of these buttons that were collected um, may have been used on clothing in some instances or may have just been um, collectibles um, as symbols or, or that kind of thing. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that um, I threw a couple of examples of our buttons in here to tease you into making a trip down to um, Lancaster to check out all the rest of them. So with that, there we go.
Oh, yes, Trish. Um, a couple of early slides of the Do you have any idea where that was done? Was it done in the Orient or was it done in Europe or here? I think most of um, most of it was probably done in Europe. And I think um, because you had the couture business really set up in Europe, especially in Paris, there are a lot of artisan um, design houses like Lesage was always doing a lot of beading in Paris. They were probably one of the beading houses that lasted the longest. Um, so you had that industry that was kind of going on over there. And of a lot of the really high end fabrics that were purchased by designers, whether they were in the United States or whether they were in Europe, um, a lot of those textiles were manufactured and a lot of those um, in Europe and a lot of those shows were over in Switzerland and Italy and um, and in France. So I'm thinking that that's probably the case. Um, not, you know, with the 18th century embroidery that was done, the floral embroidery on like men's waistcoats for the Ben Franklin and George Washington and all those guys, a lot of times they would ship that embroidery over to China um, or Asia and have those patterns you know, those pieces done over there and then shipped back and then assembled. So, um, but I think the beading was um, for the most part, Europe, possibly India, but. Glass. Um, so there's huge um, glass bead and glass button manufacturers um, in Eastern Europe around uh, the Czech Republic, Bohemia. Um, so a lot of times they were um, put in molds um, and manufactured in molds, but a lot of times those um, the beads from the 1920s are smaller um, than what more contemporary ones are, although now the Japanese are doing great um, work in beads of all different sizes. So, um, so yeah, it's, but yeah, it was way before plastics were manufactured. So when you get a dress that is really heavily beaded from the 1920s, it weighs a couple of pounds. Um, and um, so we, we, I know we had one um, in storage in the collection I'd pull out of a drawer because anything that has that many beads attached to it, you don't wanna have hanging on a hanger because that weight of gravity will pull at the shoulder seams and they'll just come apart. Um, so I pull one out that has had its shoulders reinforced and put it on a hanger and just have students go around and hold it. And you can see how their arm goes down when they actually put the dress on. It's like, and now go out and dance the Charleston, you know, as you're wearing your 10 pound weight vest, you know, to do your aerobics. So, um, so yeah, so it's, it's, but yeah, they do, um, they, they add up in the, in the poundage after a while. Yeah. So yeah, the the oldest um, the oldest garment that we have in our collection, um, oldest uh, European clothing, is mid eighteenth century. So we have a, a woman's gown and skirt and a man's three-piece suit that date to about 1750, 1760. Um, we have some textiles that go back a few more years than that. We have a 15th century Spanish textile that's red silk velvet with gold bullion embroidery. And we also have some um, fragments, um, some ninth to 11th century archeological fragments from the coast of Peru. Um, so, and then I think, um, we might have some other, um, we have a 17th century um, Japanese piece of fabric that has um, gold leaf paper woven into it in a bamboo kind of pattern. You know, it's like only a small piece, but just kind of, you know, some of the, we're you know lucky to have small pieces of different examples of, of different kinds of techniques, but then, um, so most of, most of what we have tends to be European or, I mean, some early Asian, um, but maybe 17th century is about the oldest um, other than the, I'm trying to think if we actually have some Coptic 
fourth to sixth century that would be coming out of Egypt. But um, yeah, clothing wise, it's the mid 18th century. Yeah. I just want to mention hearing you talk about this really story thing. One of the first things that struck me when I went to see the same event is that now thinking from my childhood, I consider the story. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it was, I remember um, it wasn't too many years after I started um, at Ohio State here that I got called out to a donor who had some of her children's, a lot of her kids' clothing. And so I went out to take a look at it. And um, I think it was, it was either her or it was um, the extension, the university extension um, in the 1970s had put together a wardrobe on a budget kind of thing, which they would then kind of take around to the counties to show people how they could economically purchase or use their clothes and put different outfits together. And there was a child's blouse in there that it was like, I wore that in my sixth grade class picture. I can date that exactly. <laughs> in fact, I have a picture of that. I can, so yeah. So it's like when your own clothes start to show up as, as historic. Yeah. It's like, what's the, I noticed that all of these fashions that you were showing are very spelt looking. They're small. Were there any clothes that were safe in large sizes? Yeah, there um, are. In fact, um, I, uh, I one of our one of the great pieces that we have in our collection of Charles Frederick Worth from the 1880s. The waist measurement on it, like 30 to 32 inches. So, um, which is, you know, for Victorian women, um, the, you know, is kind of um, more, the, the more well-fed you were, you know, the wealthier you were. <laughs> so it's just kind of the, the more well-off. But yeah, I mean, part of the problem of any museum collection of historic clothing is what we have the most of is what was worn the least. Um, so it's the stuff that was probably worn by people who were on the smaller side. Um, so those clothes didn't get worn out or handed down to succeeding generations to get worn out. Um, so we tend to um, have those things as the accidents of survival. So when, and I know even when I worked at the Chicago History Museum, part of my job was rehousing our women's shoe collection. And um, so it was a lot of, you know, little small size shoes. I came across this one that was, I don't know, maybe a size eight or a size 10 woman's shoe, but it had been cataloged as a man's shoe because it was so large. I was like, no, no man around the turn of the century would have worn a shoe unless he was in drag. You know, he just was not going to do it. So it was just not a man style shoe. But yeah, so we, you know, have that kind of thing. But yeah, it is the, the mostly the accidents of survival and um and i mean yeah definitely some our our nutrition and health is so much better that you know our bodies have just we exercise more so our ribs get larger we're not corseted um into smaller sizes and not you know shoving our feet into shoes to make our feet look smaller than they actually are so <clears throat> so yeah <clears throat> Still growing the collection. So, when you um, well, we don't really have a lot of room to grow the collection anymore. So, um, <clears throat> in the the case of things that we um, are looking for, are maybe more underrepresented designers. I mean, I think we have. Um, we, we just got an Ann Lowe dress in our collection and Ann Lowe was the first African-American um, recognized um, fashion designer. And she did Jackie Kennedy's um, wedding dress was kind of most well-known for that. And, um, and we have a few other African-American designers. And we, so it's really trying to, um, have more of that representation across um, ac across people of color because a lot of our student body now is changing and we want to make sure that 
we have the representative um, styles and cultures. Um, so those kinds of things we're probably focusing more on. Um, we're actually undergoing a renovation of Campbell Hall and we're gonna end up with a lot less storage space. So, um, so we're really um, going to have to be very particular about what we can add um, to the collection. And really um, my predecessor, Charles Kleibacher was so good about growing the collection between 1985 and 1995 that he um, acquired a lot of these things. Now the Terry Hamlish dress that came in during my lifetime. So I'll lay claim to that one. Um, but, um, but yeah, a lot of our, um, a lot of the, the designer, women's um, designer fashion um, came in. So we've got good examples um, of some of those signature pieces of designers. Um, but yeah, trying to get a few more um, African-American designers if we can get them. Um, Anne Lowe's, they're, they're few and far between because she really pretty much did one of a kind debutante or wedding dresses or gala, you know, kinds of gowns. So there just aren't that many out there. So the fact that we got one is pretty amazing. Um, so, but um, yeah, so it's really trying to um, build up more of those kinds of things um, that are kind of gaping holes in the collection. I mean, I know when I came in 20 years ago, we didn't have that much menswear. So I thought, you know, men wear clothes too. <laughs> so it'd be nice to have a few examples, you know, so we've added some menswear to close that gap of representation. So, um, so yeah, so we're just trying to do that. No, no, it's in fact, um, I mean, we really like to show a range. Everything does not have to be a designer. We'd like to show a range of economy um, just because not everybody can wear designer clothes. So part of that representation across the board is, um, you know, really trying to show what people in different economic levels were wearing and using. And some things have more historical interest than fashion design interest. So, um, and it's also good to kind of see how popular culture um, or, you know, culture from the streets affects the industry and vice versa. So, um, so sometimes now a lot more interesting fashion is the popular culture kind of things. Um, in fact, when we, we just finished up doing this fashion and music exhibit, and when it got to um, really showing the 1980s fashion music influences, that was a lot of rap and hip hop and glam rock and, you know, punk and goth. And, you know, so some of those things, um, it's, we really needed to go out and see if we could go back and find some of those Adidas track suits or, um, you know, some of those Tommy Hilfiger shirts um, or some of the, the stuff that was worn by the and popularized by the, the rap artists. So, you know, we got our Adidas track suit and we got our Adidas shoes and our Kangol hats and, um, you know, so we could do a little rum DMC and, um, and, uh, and uh, LL Cool J. So, um, so yeah, so we, we, we did that. But, and that's how we, a lot of times we don't necessarily get those kinds of things donated to us. So sometimes we have to go out and make some purchases to really fill in some of those gaps. And it tends to be a little more exhibit specific as we're putting something together and we realize, oh, we don't have that. We need, we should have that. Or if there's a faculty member who's, um, you know, wants to teach a specific thing. And I think now the, the faculty are getting more involved in sustainability. And so, um, so we'll kind of see what requests kind of come out of like, oh, do you have some of this in the collection? And of course, you know, World War II, there was a lot of sustainable fashion going on during the depression and in the 1940s, but, and in the 1970s, you know, there was kind of more of that. And now we're going back to um, being more interested in recycling and reusing. So, um, so yeah, so it'll be interesting to see what comes out of all of that. Yes. Um, we, yes, we've got a few. Um, we haven't um, done a lot with children's. Um, our particular program doesn't really focus a lot on children's clothing. 
And, um, but, but yeah, we have a couple of examples, but not as many. Yes. They do, they have a very large collection, um, bigger than ours at Ohio State. They also have about nine galleries that they have to fill. So uh, between their decorative arts and, and fashion. And, um, and I think they have some offsite storage for their collection as well. So they were kind of numbering around 30,000. We're numbering around 10. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's a lot. So um, um yeah so if people have questions about some things that they have um i've i've gotten a number of inquiries you know about people that aren't necessarily interested in donating it to me they just want to know more about it so we can you know set up some appointments to kind of have someone come in and take a look um, so yeah, so we'll, you know, kind of offer that on an appointment basis. So, um, yeah, cause it's, I mean, some of it is, uh, you know, sort of specific information that's, you know, to that one piece. Um, and I, I know that, um, sometimes the county extension people try to put some information out there. Um, but I don't know how accessible, um, some of that information is. I mean, some of it was on some care of collections and that kind of thing. But so there's more information out there about caring for your old historic heirlooms um, than there is on just kind of getting information about time period or um, that kind of thing. And I can't, yeah, I'll have people that are contacting me that are writing books or, you know, they came across something and they want to describe something and what's this what would someone from this time period, like, what would they have really been kind of wearing? And so if I don't know the information, I'll direct them to a professional organization that has, you know, an um, question um, kind of thing where it kind of goes to the whole membership. So all of the, the people that are expert in that particular aspect of historic clothing, you know, can answer that particular kind of question. So there's some resources out there. Thank you so much.